My reaction to his growing strength was mixed. I worried about what might happen, yet took pride in flashes of remembered battles between humans and forerunners, especially the victories. I shared his pain and shock at the power the forerunners now wielded, the fates they had meted out to humans since the end of the old wars, our weakness, our divisions, our diversity. Once we were one great race, united in power and concerted in our goals. But I saw quickly enough that this was not precisely true, and soon realized that what the Lord of Admirals believed and what he knew were at times quite separate matters. Even alive, it seemed, the original mind that had lived these ancient histories had shared the contradictions I was all too familiar with in myself and in my fellows back on air to Tyrene and here on the Great Wheel. The never cut and prepared a new walking stick for Gamopar. Recognize any of those stars? He asked me. His face was like a dark, wrinkled fruit in the sky bridge's cool, reflected glow. Not yet, I said. Stop talking about that, Venever demanded. She chopped away the last few twigs and presented him with the stick, greener and less crooked than the previous one. We need to find food and water. The dew that gathered here was muddy and bitter. We could drink from pockets of rainwater in the depressions and the boulders that lay along the edge of the chasm, but even those were drying up or thick with scum. It had been days since rain had fallen. At first light, the noise from the chasm rose like a faraway torrent. The people were on the move again after a night's rest. We listened, then got up and walked on through the gray light, each of us casting two shadows, one growing from the light cast by the brightest arc of the band, the other dimming and shortening as shadows swept the other side. Does everyone have a gayish? The never asked. Everyone down there, too? Gamopar shook his head. The lady seeds her gardens, but she may also pluck weeds. What if we are the weeds? Venebra asked. The old man chuckled. He sounded young. If I did not look at him, I could almost imagine he was young. But the impression was fleeting. The librarian, the life shaper, the lady, as these two called her, did not seem to care if those who bore her imprint grew old or suffered and died. That obvious fact seemed important, but I was too tired and thirsty to think it through. Cool air crept down the embankment and spilled into the chasm. Tell us more about Airdom, Gamopar said to me, his voice growing hoarse. Is that where all the people come from, long ago? Venebra asked. Not even you remember that far back, Gamopar. Too thirsty to talk, I croaked. Without warning, my ears popped, and the dust in the chasm bellied upward, lapped over the edge, and billowed toward us. Along with the dust came the strange, high sound of thousands of people screaming. Gamopar groaned and clutched his ears. Venever leaned forward, hands on her knees, as if she were about to be sick. The sky above darkened. Stars twinkled. Breath came harder. Discouraged, gasping, my head throbbing and chest burning, I lay beside Venevra and the old man. Venevra had closed her eyes tight and was trembling all over like a fawn. Gamopar lay on his back, the new green stick held across his chest. Grit floated everywhere, wet and clinging, clogging our noses and getting in our eyes. We could barely see. All around the land again began to shake. Boulders rocked ponderously in their sandy beds, and a few started to lean, then tumble over. Some rolled to the edge of the chasm and vanished in swirls of muddy vapor. I could swear I felt the entire land beneath us rippling like the hide of a water buffalo tired of stinging flies. The old man painfully dragged himself beside Venevra and laid his arm over her. I joined them. I saw streamers of dust ascending like thunderheads many thousands of meters, obscuring the sky bridge as well as the stars. Then a great white shadow of dust covered us. Lightning played nearby. Diffuse flashes followed nine or ten finger clicks later by thunder. Thunder 
that would once have terrified me, but now seem nothing. I wondered if the entire halo were about to shiver itself to pieces. Was it possible for such a great forerunner object to be destroyed? Of course. We laid waste their fleets, attacked their outpost worlds, and the forerunners themselves found a way to bring down the indestructible architecture of the precursors on Sharum Hakor. Sharum Hakor, once called the Eternal. The Lord of Admirals had no fear. He was already dead. Then came the deluge. It fell of a sudden, curtaining sheets of water that pounded the ground until we started to sink. With an effort, I pushed against the suck of the mud, then dragged Venevra to firmer sand and the overhang of a very large boulder that did not seem interested in either shaking or rolling. My motive was simple. Venevra knew where we should go. The old man did not. But that did not stop me from crawling back to get him. Walking was impossible in the thudding rain, each drop the size of a grape and cold as ice. Gamalpar, half buried in mud, struggled feebly to free himself. I rose on my knees, sank immediately to my thighs, and, reaching down, took hold of the center of a stick. His fists grabbed the stick tight, and I half dragged, half carried him through the muck to where Venevra waited. We lay under the rock overhang as the land continued to shake. Sleep was impossible. We stared out into the plashing, thundering dark. Wretched, chilled to the bone, but no longer thirsty. We took turns drinking from water that quickly filled a fold in one of my rag garments. Cold and sweet, even if it wanted to drown us, even if it wanted to be our death. At one point during the darkness, the boulder gave out a mighty crack, louder than the thunder, and sharp chips sprayed down over us. I reached up and found a fissure wide enough to accept the tip of a finger. Feeling in the fissure, I imagined it closing suddenly and jerked back my hand, then wrapped myself in my arms and settled down. We were convinced that it would crash down on us at any second, yet we did not move. The overhang did not fall. The boulder did not split apart. We saw little or nothing through that long, dark day beyond the occasional silvery flash. Numbness overtook us. We did not sleep, neither did we think. Misery filled the void behind our eyes. We were waiting for change, any change. Nothing else would rouse us from this mortification of fear and tingling boredom. Day passed into night, followed by another day. Finally both rain and the rippling ground ceased abruptly, as if at the wave of a masterful hand. We stared out across the mud at wan, milky sunlight, condensing over the chasm into a double, no, a triple rainbow, each brilliant, gaily colored streamer intersecting, fading slowly from one end, brightening at the other, and disappearing. Venevra ventured out first. She pulled and plunged through the mud for a few paces, then stood upright, lifting her arms to the light, moving her lips, but making no sound. Silent prayer. Who does she pray to? I asked Gamopar, who lay on his side, the green walking stick still clutched in one hand. No one, he said. We have no gods we trust. But we're alive, I reasoned. Surely that's worth thanks to somebody. <laughs> pray to the wheel, then, Gamopar said. He crawled out from under the overhang, pushed up on his stick, and stood up for the first time in many hours. His legs trembled, but he kept upright, lifting first one foot loose from the mud, then another. I was the last, but I moved quicker and boldly walked along firmer, stony ground to the chasm. The migration below had stopped. I thought for a moment, peering down through the clear air, that those thousands were dead, drowned, or struck down by avalanches. But then I saw some of them move, one by one, individuals, then groups, and finally crowds picked themselves up, stumbled about in confusion, then coordinated, touched each other, and continued in the same direction as before, just like wildebeest, but much closer to us than before. 
The floor of the chasm, the foundation material, had heaved itself up as if on the shoulders of a giant rising almost halfway in the ditch. The great scar was closing. Soon the chasm would be gone, filled in with forerunner metal. Here was a force, a presence, a monstrous god, if you will, that could undergo great change, suffer hideous injuries, yet still heal itself. There was nothing mightier in our lives. Praying to the halo might not be a bad idea after all. I held out my hands like a shaman, as if to personally tap into the power of what had just happened. Venevra looked at me as if I were crazy. I smiled, but she turned away without a word. There had been no end of fools in her life. 